Uh, welcome to the first annual uh, Dave Park Memorial Lecture. Dave Park was a beloved pulmonary and critical care physician at Harborview Medical Center who died just over two years ago at the age of 54 after a long battle with, long, long, with brain cancer. He came to the University of Washington with his wife, Julie, for residency training. And he went on to be chief resident at Harborview, uh, entered fellowship training, and joined faculty in the Division of Pulmonary and Critical Care Medicine. Dave and Julie had two children who are now young adults. Hailing from Vermont, Dave was blunt, frank, and free-spoken, as befitted his New England heritage. He possessed common sense in abundance and brought it to the practice of medicine. He was loved by his patients for his listening abilities and ability to align his care with their needs. Dave was a teacher par excellence and the recipient of many awards. He was a valued colleague, mentor, and friend. Dave had particular interest in non-tuberculous mycobacteria, tuberculosis, and medical education. And these will be the themes of this annual memorial lecture series. <clears throat> Which brings me to our inaugural speaker. Dr. Charles Daly is the chief of the Division of Mycobacterial and Respiratory Infections at National Jewish Health in Denver. Dr. Daly completed his college and medical school at the University of Mississippi and residency, chief residency and fellowship training in pulmonary and critical care medicine at UCSF. He was on faculty at UCSF before joining National Jewish in 2004. Dr. Daly is an international expert on NTMs and TB, particularly multi-drug resistant tuberculosis. And he is the rare expert who is equally admired and respected for his clinical acumen and research and public health accomplishments. He has reached the pinnacle of any field. One only needs to say the name Chuck for others to know who you're talking about. <clears throat> he is humble and accessible to patients, physicians who are seeking advice, which I have done on a number of occasions, and trainees. It was clear who the first speaker for this annual series should be, um, Dr. Daly. Thank you, Dave. Uh, this is quite an honor for me to be here to uh, give the inaugural uh, lecture for uh, another Dave, Dave Park. Dave and I were friends for at least 20 plus years. Uh, the TB world is a very small world, and uh, we ended up hanging out together for a long time. Uh, talked about uh, a few things, including something he was very interested in, cars. Uh, I'm an Audi guy, he was a BMW guy. Uh, but he might have convinced me <laughs> to switch, so we're thinking about that. Uh, but Dave had all the qualities that uh, Dave just described, uh, a very humble person. He had that sparkle in his eye, uh, a warm smile, and, and I never saw that leave him, even under the worst circumstances. It was always there, always part of him. Now, when I thought about what I was going to discuss, you would think, well, maybe TB, because that, that was probably our initial connection. But really, over the past decade, when he and I communicated about patients, patients that we shared, or discussed, it was really NTM, it was non-tuberculous mycobacteria that really brought us together um, uh, as colleagues. So today that's what I'll talk about, non-tuberculous mycobacterial infections. And the subtitle today is What's in a Name? That which we call a rose by any other name would smell as sweet. Obviously this is Shakespeare, and who's, who is this who's saying this? This is Juliet. She's talking about Romeo, who is a Montague very wealthy, powerful family. And her point was, names don't matter. What she meant by that was, your power and money doesn't matter. I love you for who you are. I'm gonna make the argument, however, in a different setting, the setting of NTM, the name means a lot. A few disclosures. Uh, I was one of the site investigators in the phase two uh, uh, multi-center uh, grant looking at uh, Alice, um, which is um, amicacin liposome <clears throat> inhaled suspension, and I've been on the advisory boards of these companies, all of which have a molecule or molecules in development for NTM, not TB necessarily, but NTM. Uh, I, 10 years ago, this would have been nothing on my slide. So we're very happy, and I hope I can have it on two slides someday. <clears throat> 
So this is the outline. Uh, first, I want to make sure we're all on the same page. What are NTM? So briefly, we'll talk about that. Um, and then I want to make the point that this is an important disease process. It is a, a, literally an epidemic that's been unfolding quietly uh, under our noses now for probably a decade. <clears throat> probably the hardest thing to do in this setting as a clinician is to make the distinction between are these organisms harming the patient or not. Unlike TB, we have to make this distinction between quote, colonization and disease, and then I'll end with what's in a name. Really doesn't matter what the species is, and that's what I mean by name. <clears throat> this is a, the taxonomy that we've been living with for many years. Mycobacterium is a genus of which there are now recognized 197 species and 14 subspecies. So you all need to know the names of these things. <clears throat> now most of you know the more famous uh, brothers and sisters, which is Mycobacterium com tuberculosis complex, Mycobacterium leprae, now people, some call it a complex, but the rest of them are NTM, so almost 200 species. And if you look, this is the number of species going back from 1970 to more recently up to this near 200. You can see there's just been a dramatic increase in the number of identified species. And this is not because they're mutating and evolving quickly before our eyes, but this is really more based on molecular methods to be able to identify them more precisely. Now, I, I wish I didn't have to show you this slide um, because I'm talking about names today. Well, it turns out there has just been a, a revolution in the name. It has changed. These are now the adopted names that we're still not using uh, because we don't agree with the approach. So mycobacterium, the genus, has now been broken into five genera. Mycobacterioides, mycolysobacterium, mycolysobacter, mycolysobacillus, and then mycobacterium, which still <coughs> includes tuberculosis. But obsessus, for example, which I'll talk about, officially is now my mycobacterioides. Now, I'm showing you this slide, but I want you to forget it <laughs> because we're not going to talk about this again, except to say that this is evolving. And we have had two manuscripts uh, in which they sent back to us. We had called obsessus incorrectly as mycobacterium obsessus. It was actually mycobacterioides obsessus. So this is a real issue right now. But I'm going to go back to what we've been doing for a long time. Now, these are just some NTM that have been reported to cause lung disease. They're divided into the traditional slowly growing and rapidly growing. Rapidly growing scares a patient when they hear that, but these don't grow very rapidly. The distinction is really seven days. They grow, you see colony formation on a subculture within seven days with the rapidly growing and longer if it's a slowly growing. Now, I've highlighted uh, the most important pulmonary pathogens. That's avium, chimera, and intracellulari. We call those MAC, Mycobacterium avium complex. And then the ones you see under the rapidly growing belong to Mycobacterium obsessus. And as I'll show you, these are now called subspecies, uh, true obsessus, baledii, and mycelians. And, and hence, the names you will see are very important. So is this important? Well, these are four population-based studies. There are many other studies that have looked at the epidemiology. These have focused on North America. Uh, and I thank Ted Maris, one of my former fellows, for putting these data together. So what you see under frequency are two columns, isolation and disease. Now, if we were talking about tuberculosis, we wouldn't need two columns, right? If you grow a colony of uh, TB, mycobacterium TB in the right setting, that's disease. <laughs> But here we do, because we know that just because someone grows uh, one of these organisms in their sputum specimen or bronx specimen does not mean that they have disease. So the first study is you, was four uh, HMOs in the United States. It was using ICD-9 codes, so uh, their databases, during the time period that you see. And the isolation frequency of pulmonary uh, NTM was almost 12 per 100,000. But only about half of the time was it causing disease. In a U.S. Medicare population, so these are older individuals, 65 and older. Uh, this was not an ICD-9 code, uh, so the, they don't have a, I'm sorry, this was uh, no micro data, so they don't have isolation frequency. But look how high the rate of disease in this older population, 47 per 100,000. Uh, uh, Ted Maris in Ontario, Canada, uh, they benefit from the fact that over 95% of all mycobacterial isolates goes to the provincial laboratory. So they have really good capture in Ontario, and their isolation frequency was around 13, but again, about half. So if you go down, 
it's about half the time that we isolated it looks like it's causing the organism is causing disease. Now, let's put this into some perspective. Where does TB sit in this? Well, in the U.S., the TB rate is about 3 per 100,000. So look in the older population, 65 and greater, 47 per 100,000. So this is a dramatic the increased prevalence compared to TB. Now, the other reason these data are important is they all had trends. So if you look across from the top down, 3% per year increase, 8.5% year increase, 10% in Ontario per year increase, and 2% in Oregon, Kevin Winthrop's group. So I think we have a highly prevalent disease, more prevalent than tuberculosis in North America, and increasing, it's fairly dramatic. I mean, how many diseases are increasing at 10% per year? Not many. So this, this has been happening now for over a decade. What we don't have are really good data because it's not reportable. We don't have the kind of prevalence and incidence data that we have with TB. Um, this is a study from NIH that tried to get at this, looking at uh, some estimates. So they estimated in 2010, based on the Medicare data and some modeling to go down below 65, that it was about 86,000 cases in the U.S. And if those increases per year were correct, they estimated by 2014 it was going to be 181,000 cases in the U.S. Way, way above what we see in terms of tuberculosis. But unlike TB, this is an environmental organism, so therefore you know it's going to vary uh, by geography. It's going to vary across the U.S. And what you see here, the annual uh, number of cases, and the, as we get into uh, lighter to darker colors, increasing uh, cases. So we can see in California, Texas, Florida, Northeast, over 3,000 cases a year. But really what I think is more important is the rate, how many per 100,000. Per uh, we can see Florida is still there. And what's the number one state in terms of the highest rate of pulmonary NTM? Where do you go on vacation? <laughs> Hawaii. So Hawaii is number one, Florida number two. Um, uh, and and where are you all? <laughs> yeah, so you're kind of in the middle. Uh, and I would bet it, you will be seeing these go up. Now, why are they going up? This is a million dollar question. Everyone wants to know why so we can do something to stop it. Uh, we don't know why, but it's probably multifactorial. Exposures have increased in the past decades. You know, we're showering more, less baths. We used to shower very infrequently. Now we shower two, three times a day. If we're going to the gym, we might shower at two or three different places. We have hot tubs, sa uh, saunas, spas. We've changed our plumbing. We went from um, a uh, copper based to PVC. Copper does not allow biofilm to grow very well, or PVC very much lets it grow. Um, we've also decreased hot water temperatures. Uh, to decrease scalding, save energy. Um, these things, they, if you increase your hot water temperature to above about 135 Fahrenheit, the concentration goes down. So that probably has had some impact. Diagnostics, they've gotten better. They're more sensitive. Our culture methods are more sensitive for NTM. Everybody gets a CT scan. Uh, I can't, you probably got one when you came in here. I mean, they're, <laughs> they're everywhere. So we're seeing those little central lobular nodules that we couldn't see on chest x-rays. And that makes us think about mycobacteria. We have an aging population. We have more lung disease. These are populations I'll show in a moment that are at higher risk. We have more immunosuppressed individuals. Uh, and something that I think is interesting is this idea of perhaps decreasing cross immunity with uh, mycobacterium tuberculosis. Uh, I'll show you something uh, in just a second. And what about the organism? Most of what's been written in terms of guidelines, they don't really address the organism. They don't get into the names. They don't talk about which one it is and does it matter which one it is. And have we somehow selected by our water temperatures or something else we've done in terms of the treatment of our water to enhance the virulence of these organisms? So this was something we did with Sarah Broad uh, and Ted Maris. It was a systematic review of 22 studies. Um, and what you see here, NTM incidents, TB incidence, and the percentage of NTM over all mycobacteria. The bottom line is in the NTM incidence in these 22 studies, uh, it was going up in most. There were 75% had increasing uh, NTM, 12 and a half were stable, and 12 and a half it was declining. Uh, this was occurring in the setting of TB going down in almost all those settings, which therefore changed the ratio. Uh, so 
for the proportion of micro disease due to NTM was rising in 94% of the geographic areas. And in most of those settings, TB was going down. So it's just interesting. It's maybe an epiphenomena where TB is going down, NTM is going up. So who gets, who gets this disease? If you look at it from the host perspective, most patients <clears throat> excuse me, with pulmonary disease do appear to have some susceptibility, a chink in their armor. There are those who have underlying conditions in which the rates of NTM are quite high, like cystic fibrosis, alpha-1 anatrypsin, COPD. At the top of the list, though, is bronchiectasis. In uh, a study from Denmark, which was a population-based study, people with bronchiectasis had an odds ratio of 187 times that of people without bronchiectasis for pulmonary NTM. That's an extraordinary risk. There are also those who probably are quite healthy. And they just had a very large exposure, maybe at their indoor pool where they're a lifeguard, because we know of those cases, uh, where they're breathing in a, a contaminated aerosol hours a day. And then this very interesting group um, that I think many of you are familiar with, it's called Lady Windermere Syndrome, after the Oscar Wilde play, uh, Lady Windermere's fan. This is a certain phenotype of tall, thin, light women, usually Caucasian, usually non-smokers, who also have uh, other phenotypes like kyphoscoliosis, pectus, mitral valve prolapse. Um, and it, it's quite dramatic. In a study from NIH by Kim, um, uh, who is here uh, in Seattle, um, the women who had NTM were different than those who did not in every way they measured morphologically. So it's really quite a striking uh, phenotype. And, and we say that when we go out into the waiting room, uh, I can usually pick my next patient. I mean, it, in National Jewish, it's, it's that common. There are environmental exposures. Some of this uh, uh, comes from uh, uh, here in, in Seattle, but also from uh, national studies from NIH looking at the environment, because that's clearly important. They live in the environment. If you have soil exposure, indoor swimming, about six times the risk of those who don't do that of having a pulmonary NTM. There are climatic factors, meaning you know, where you live and what you breathe, uh, the proportion of surface water, uh, hence Seattle someday, we'll probably see more of these, because you have a lot of water around you. Um, and then various things that relate to soil and soil density have all been shown uh, to have uh, increased risk of uh, pulmonary NTM. So the environment is important. The argument is that the host is more important, but I'm gonna argue it takes two to tango right? It, it doesn't matter what your susceptibility is if you're not exposed. And if you're exposed and don't have a susceptibility, you really need both. So two to tango, host susceptibility in the right environment where there's common or a, a lot of exposure. All right, now let's talk about this issue that's staring all clinicians in the face, which is who has disease and who doesn't. So ATS and IDSA uh, years ago came up with these diagnostic criteria. They assume the patient has clinical symptoms consistent with pulmonary NTM, like cough, fatigue, weight loss, that it occurs in the right radiographic setting. You see the two kind of flavors here. Uh, the top panel is a CT of someone with nodular bronchiectatic disease, non-cavitary, whereas the bottom is fibrocavitary. This looks like tuberculosis, often enters the public health system as a rule out TB. They don't grow TB, they grow MAC or something else. And then finally, we can't forget, this is an infectious disease. We need to isolate the organism, hence the name. You need to know which organism of those 200, which one is it that is in the sputum specimen from your patient. The guidelines say two or more positive cultures to call this disease as opposed to colonization. And I'll show you uh, where those data come from. Or one positive from a bronchoscopy specimen. So I wish that criteria had been validated in some population, but it has not. It's been out there more than a decade and has never been validated. So we don't know the predictive values, positive or negative, of what it means to meet or not meet those criteria in terms of the possibility of progression. These are just some examples of studies that have tried to get at this issue. In a study I was involved in with Wonjin Ko at Samsung Medical Center, 14% of patients who had one or more positive cultures for MAC progressed over 16 months. Now, this is a slowly progressive disease. We all know that number will go up with time. We don't yet know what that number is, but at 16 months, it looks like it's about 
in a study we did in San Francisco, oh, so, sorry, uh, I think I live in Denver now, Denver, 38% um, um, with CF uh, that had MAC and one or more positive cultures progressed now over four and a half years. So in that very high risk population, not everyone is progressing over that time frame. And then 98% of people with two or more positive cultures with MAC progressed over about a 12 month follow up. Now this was a study from Sukumura in Japan, 1991, and this is the basis of the two cultures in the ATS IDSA criteria. But the devil's in the details here. Each of these patients had been hospitalized for a minimum of six months. They had fibro, they had cavitary, fibrocavitary <coughs> smear positive disease. Well, most of the patients that I see, that's not who they are. They're ambulatory, walking, <coughs> nodular bronchiectatic disease. So the 98% is not right for the majority of our patients. We just need to find somewhere in between what the answer is. What's the predictive value of an appropriate diagnostic criteria? So it's back in our lap. As a clinician, we have to decide based on the patient, the organism, the name of that organism, and the goals of therapy. So by the patient, I mean, do were they in any of those circles I showed you? Do they have bronchiectasis, COPD, some form of increased risk or susceptibility? I'm probably more likely to treat someone like that. Do they have clinical symptoms consistent with disease? You all know the, the joke. I mean, if you don't have symptoms, I can make you have symptoms by giving you three drugs. So we have to think about, if they're not symptomatic, how am I gonna benefit them? Extensive radiographic abnormality, I think is probably the most useful for me. If we see cavitation, that's progression. That's lung destruction. There's no debate there. And if I see nodules appearing over time, that's progression. So the radiographs are very important here. Now the bug is very important. This is just to make a point that at the top of the scale here were organisms in the Netherlands that were seen in patients. And four out of four who grew sulgi, two out of two colatum, uh, th that means that they met ATS criteria. So every time that, that someone grew those organisms, they met ATS criteria for disease, suggesting they're more pathogenic. As we go down this pathogenicity scale, we get to things that are in our water. Mycobacterium simiae, uh, Terre, Gordone, all, all of those are down at this end. They don't usually cause disease. So when you grow something, you need to know where that organism sits on this kind of concept of pathogenicity. It sits somewhere. We don't know for most of those 200 where they sit. And we will never know if the laboratories don't identify them if we don't know their names. And then ultimately cure. In TB, even MDR-TB, every time I see a patient, I plan to cure them. That's, that's the goal. But with some of these organisms, cure is not possible. And so we have to talk about other things we can do. Can we improve symptoms? Can we slow progression? Uh, it's a very different discussion. We, we would be very helped if we understood better who's going to progress. So biomarker development is occurring. Uh, some studies Jerry Nick is doing in the CF program at uh, National Jewish to look at biomarkers of progression. This is a study looking at what we have now, uh, 488 patients with MAC pulmonary disease as per ATS criteria. You know, what happened to them in this program in Korea? Well, 60, almost 63% progressed, but not all did. You know, almost a quarter seemed to be stable. And of those who were stable, about half of them who were untreated, they converted back to negative with no treatment, with no antimicrobial therapy. If you look at the risk factors for each of these, so progression was associated basically with a higher bacterial load and uh, architect uh, architectural destruction of the lung. Those who were stable, had, they were healthier, higher BMI, they had less symptoms. And of those that spontaneously converted, they tended to be younger, also healthier, and AFP smear negative. So th we need these kind of studies. I don't think this is the one that's gonna help me that much because I, I know this already as a clinician, but we do need these prospective studies, hopefully with biomarkers uh, uh, placed into the study. What's in a name? Let's start with a patient, 35 year old Caucasian woman from Florida with a cough for several weeks. I don't know how well it's projecting, but up in this uh, right apex, there's a cavitary lesion. So of course they said you have TB and they put her on TB uh, therapy but she didn't grow TB. She grew MAC repeatedly. 
and ultimately she she was diagnosed with MAC pulmonary disease. She was started on a multi-drug treatment regimen, um, kind of a weird regimen. They didn't start a standard regimen. They looked at drug susceptibilities, drug susceptibility testing, except for the macrolides and amikacin don't predict clinical outcome. So we don't really look at those very carefully when it's rifampin and ethambutol. If it says resistant, we still use them in a n treatment naive patient. But they, they believe them, so they dropped out some of the first line drugs and put in some second line drugs. So she started out on a weak regimen. We'll come back to her. MAC. So they told her she had MAC, but what's MAC? I've circled here the most common species of MAC, Chimera intracellular avium. All of these are MAC. There are now 12 species of MAC. So I don't like the term MAI because that assumes there's two species. Avium and intracellulary, back in the AIDS days when we started learning about MAC, that's what we knew, that there were two species. But now there are probably 12 species of MAC. Most laboratories do not tell us this. In fact, most don't tell you about Chimera, which is the third most common and was the, the cause of a very serious, still, still happening, outbreak uh, of disseminated Chimera among patients exposed to heater cooler units. Well, many hospitals didn't know they had any chimera because they weren't told. They were told it was intracellulary. But if you sequence intracellulary, as I'll show you in a moment, some of those are actually chimera. So this is a study uh, that came out last year that gets to this issue. They looked at 91 patients who had mycobacterium intracellulary as identified through phenotypic analysis, not sequencing. But then they took those and they sequenced them and they were able to show that, yes, they were right, 82% of the time it was intracellular, but 9% of the time it was chimera, 4% indicus prinii, which is not actually a species now, 4% yonganets. So multi-locus multi sequencing <coughs> showed uh, some precision that, that you don't get if you stop at the phenotypic level. And then they said, well, does it matter what the name is? And they looked to see how many met ATS criteria, and you can see the variation. Among the chimera, only 38% met, met guidelines uh, or definition, 75% of uh, this organism, whatever it happens to be, and 50% of yonganets. So it shows that we do have the capability now with sequencing and other molecular methods to, to tell the clinician what the name is, and the name matters in terms of how the patient does. So these are four ways that I thought we could look at this. One is acquisition. Does it matter, the species, in terms of where you get it from? Well, this seems to be fairly clear. The M. avium and chimera are primarily water-based organisms. Intracellular looks to be more soil-based. We're not finding it in our water specimens. Those that were previously identified as intracellular have now been shown to be chimera. They weren't intracellular. So this is important for your patient and for you to understand where, what are they doing in terms of their their day, are they swimming in the indoor pool? Uh, where are they getting infected? Because as you'll see, they may get it again. Pathogenicity, I'll show you a little bit of data showing that intracellular looks to be more pathogenic, and patients therefore present with more advanced disease when they have intracellular compared to avium or chimera. And regarding all those other MAC species, we have no idea. And there are some data suggesting that even treatment outcomes may vary. So two studies, one by Wen Jin Ko at Samsung, fairly large study, 590 patients. Now they say they don't have chimera there, and so they had zero chimera. It was kind of split almost evenly between avium and intracellular. And they followed this cohort to see what the predictors for progression were. Microbiologic, high bacterial load, but they showed that M. intracellular had an increased risk compared to avium. So this is one of the first studies to show that the, the the name or the species mattered in terms of how patients did. Another study uh, by Boyle in Chicago, uh, similar approach, similar size study. They did find that 28% of their cases had chimera. Very similar findings, high bacteriologic load, but here um, avium and intracellular look to be uh, more likely to be associated with progression compared to chimera, and then extensive radiographic disease was that these studies finally started pulling the organism out and looking at it and its impact on progression. What about treatment? So first, I just want to, how do we treat this disease? The most important thing to identify clinically is whether the isolate is macrolide susceptible or resistant. 
Um, if it's susceptible, the next question is, are there cavities present radiographically? If the answer to that is no, the current recommendation is to consider three times a week therapy with a three-drug macrolide-based regimen. If there is cavitation present, we recommend you don't use three times a week and that you use daily therapy, but it's the same drugs. If the patient is unfortunate enough to have a macrolide-resistant isolate, then we don't use the macrolide unless we're using it for some other purpose. And we have to find another drug. I put in the center box some of the drugs that we look at, like fluoroquinolones, clofazamine, modaquilin, we're using more, uh, inhaled amikacin, and some other drugs. If they have macrolide-resistant disease and they have cavita or have cavitation, we think about the addition of intravenous amikacin, usually for about two months. Uh, so this is uh, the, the current approach. Now, if you use this approach, what can you tell your patient to expect? If they have macrolide-susceptible, non-cavitary disease, culture conversion is at about 80%. Cavitary disease that falls in the range that we've seen published is between 50 and 80% culture conversion. If they have macrolide-resistant, things are very different. If you do no surgical resection in that patient, and if you do not give them a prolonged course of aminoglycoside, culture conversion is 5%. It's not curable unless you do something more. So if you do some surgery in selected patients and provide aminoglycoside, we showed at Samsung Medical Center, 15%. Uh, that's as high as we could get culture conversion. And David Griffith showed many years ago that if you did surgical resection and gave them six or more months of intravenous or parenteral uh, um, aminoglycoside, you could get it back up to 80%, but at a big cost to the patient. Part of their lung, deafness, they, you know, this is, this is not the way we want to go. So obviously we need to prevent uh, the development of macrolide resistance. Now, once you cure the patient, what happens? So using those same regimens, there are three studies from Tyler, Chicago, and Samsung. You can see the number of patients and you can see the recurrence rate. So this is microbiologic recurrence. These are patients that converted, you thought you cured, and now you're following them and they've become positive again. What you see is 48% recurrence in the study from uh, Texas, 25% in uh, Chicago, and 29% in uh, South Korea. So let's just say a quarter to a half of patients recur. If you then genotype those with either pulse field electrophoresis or rep PCR, you can see in Texas, 75% had a new strain. So we would use the term reinfection. They got it again. And it was about 50 to 75% in the other studies. So recurrence is pretty high with MAC, even though you convert 80% of people, but they get it again. <clears throat> now, what are the predictors of that? So one study now has looked at the issue of what does the organism contribute to recurrence? And this is the study that I showed you a moment ago from Chicago, published by Boyle. So in multivariate analysis in that cohort of people who recurred, these are predictors of that. Um, but the ones I just want to highlight at the moment is the bug. They did look at the organism and showed that people with avium and chimera were more likely to recur than intracellulary. Now, this is the only study that's really looked at this. I'm kind of not a believer uh, in this right now. It doesn't make a lot of sense to me, but I think this is an important point. You, we need to start looking at the organism when we look at things like recurrence. Not even the organism, but the strain. I couldn't leave treatment without bringing this up, and that is that we have for the first time uh, an approved drug. Uh, September 28th, the FDA approved uh, ALICE, I mentioned before, amikacin liposome inhalation suspension uh, for the treatment of uh, treatment refractory MAC. Um, and this may also give us a way to consider how we might decrease those recurrence levels. Um, so what you see here in this randomized uh, phase three study, those who got ALICE plus what GBT means guideline-based therapy, what I reviewed with you, versus guideline-based therapy alone, you can see the percentage of patients uh, looking at the proportion with uh, negative sputum. So here's the group that got ALICE, and we can see very, within a month, we start to see separation in culture conversion. And by month four, it's statistically significant, about 30% culture conversion in these very difficult to treat refractory patients. And if you do nothing different, it's only 9%. So this taught us that we can't do the same thing in people who aren't converting their cultures by six months because they're not gonna convert. We need to do something else. And this is now an FDA approved approach, which is to add ALICE. And if we continue that, what we're curious about is even, could it help decrease those recurrences in some way? 
kind of like we think about the use of uh, tobermycin for pseudomonas. Uh, it's an interesting idea, obviously one that uh, deserves um, some study. The final thing I want to say about Mac is this, and this is a, a haunting thing for me. This is one of my patients, 62-year-old woman with fatigue, chronic cough. You can see in the base, she's got a little bit of bronchiectasis, pretty, very minor disease, but she had multiple positive uh, cultures and she was symptomatic. Now, the outside laboratory had grown M. avium complex. That's all, all they knew. We got a specimen and were able to tell them it was specifically it was avium and is very important in this case. And this is just one example of many. So we were very happy. She converted to negative, just what we thought would happen. But then she had a positive culture again, avium. We went, okay, let's just right now, you're not at six months yet, let's keep going. Oops, but then she grew chimera. That's a different species. They're not confused. This is a different species of Mac. Oh, so then she's got this kind of hybrid chimera youngenets. And then she's negative. Oh, now it's youngenets. She has a mixed infection or she's getting repeatedly infected. This person is a gardener. She spends sometimes up to eight hours gardening, digging in the soil. And, you know, so I don't know if that's where she was getting things from, but but the point is, this is what we're seeing now that we're sequencing people for research. We're seeing multiple species. And sometimes when we look at the species and we'll see, it'll be intracellular, 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 but it's a different strain genetically. So this is very important that we get a, a, a grasp on this because she wasn't technically failing therapy from her avium. We got rid of the avium, but we, we, we ended up with something else. So let me move on to something easier, mycobacterium abscessus. So this is a 68-year-old woman, of one of my patients, with chronic cough and fatigue. You can see that she had multiple cavities. She was New York City. They said, ah, you have TB. You know, she was quarantined, and she hated that, and they put her on four-drug therapy. But then she grew abscessus, not TB, and she also grew MAC. You can see the, the multiple cavitations that were present, so very extensive disease. So we treated her for both organisms. That was, at one point, she was on up to seven drugs, I think, at, for a few months. We cured the MAC. She never got MAC again, but she never, we never, despite up, it, up to eight years of continuous intravenous infusions, we couldn't get rid of the abscesses, and she ultimately died from that. So abscesses. Now, this is a, the name has been very difficult for clinicians to follow and microbiologists. This was discovered in 1953, officially named as abscesses in 1992. It came from this person's knee and buttocks. Um, um, it was an extrapulmonary source, so the type strain is an extrapulmonary strain. It was called abscesses. 2006, uh, Atacambi said, based on genomic studies, it's really three species. I mentioned these uh, uh, earlier. 2011, because of a naming violation, Massilience was withdrawn. And then they were collapsed into Baletii. But they actually are genomically different. They're different organisms. This was really a problem. There are still laboratories in the U.S. that only tell the clinician it's one of these two. But we know that most of those called Baletii in that system are actually Massilians. And as I'm about to show you, that's a hugely important thing to know. Then uh, with collaborators in uh, Korea, we we felt they should be called uh, subspecies. Uh, genomically, they weren't different enough to be a species. This was confirmed um, in uh, 2016 by another group. 2017, Atacambi came back and said, no, we disagree, it's uh, here. So it's kind of this circle, I mean, just going around. Officially right now, they're subspecies as of today. Okay, so let's think of those same things for abscesses. Does the, does the subspecies matter? In terms of transmission, pathogenicity, clinical presentation, or outcomes. And it turns out here in two areas, I think it matters. In terms of transmission, it looks like obsessive subspecies Massilience appears to be more transmissible, uh, although I'll show you we're not 100% sure of that yet. And treatment outcomes, though, this is really the message of the day, dramatically vary based on which, not species, but which subspecies they have. So many of you may know Dr. Aiken's uh, report, uh, an alarming report in 2013 of an outbreak of M. obsessus subspecies Massilience here uh, in the CF clinic. Five patients developed uh, uh, M. obsessus pulmonary disease with what appeared to be the same strain based on, uh, at the time, pulse field uh, electrophoresis. This was followed by two reports from Cambridge, uh, Josephine Bryant, 
They found two clustered outbreaks of near identical isolates of abscessus in their CF patients uh, between 2007 and 11. And then in a, a, a seminal study in, published in Science uh, a couple of years ago, uh, global clusters of this same strain uh, of both M. abscessus and I'll strain this M. mycelient strain that I j was seen in the other two. So this had the CF world turned upside down. This looked to be transmissible from CF patient to CF patient. Well, we've been telling you for years and our patients, this is not transmissible. Don't worry about it. TB is transmissible, but not NTM. So this has changed. This is a paradigm shift in our thinking. So we have been funded under the leadership of Jerry Nick, who runs our adult CF program in, in this particular project, uh, uh, Nabi Hassan. We've been doing whole genome sequencing of isolates and CF patients from around the U.S. In this particular project, 341 NTM isolates from 191 CF patients from 45 CF centers in the U.S. in 22 states. We found 13 species, um, but it was heavily M. obsessus because centers were sending us M. obsessus because they were afraid of M. obsessus. So it, it, it could be that that's not really what's happening in CF. It could be more evenly distributed. Uh, and 31%, again, the message, had more than one species. Mixed infection or repeated infections, we don't understand how, how that's happening. But the issue for us is, is this really being transmitted person to person? Or is it, these are environmental organisms. So isn't it also possible in some settings that it's from the environment? So this is a first stab looking at the SNP difference, the genomic difference, and those from CF facilities and uh, uh, different facilities are the same. So on this scale, the lower we go, the more identical genomically. These down here, based on Bayesian analysis, are 99% likely to be identical. Some of these have a SNP difference of five, five nucleotide difference. I mean, it's hard to be more identical than that. So we're pretty convinced these are, these are the same uh, strain. The next plot here is they're in different states or the same. So basically the way this analysis is, you just compare two different strains and look at the SNP difference aligned by where the CF centers are the same or different. So what we see down here is that there's, the, the difference here is really not significant. It's, it's maybe gonna get there as the study gets bigger, uh, but it looks like within the CF facility, whether you're in a different or the same facility, it, it does, it's not much difference. But if you go to states, it turns out that this is significant and it turns out that they're actually more similar if they live in different states. I mean, what is this saying? Well, these, this preliminary is saying that there's clearly a geographic component to this similarity. It does not mean that transmission is not occurring, but there's also a geographic element. And so as we study this more, we have to control for that issue. These are environmental organisms. So you, if you live in an area, you probably will have a similar strain, but a lot more needs to be done to figure out this. Now, in regards to treatment, and this is, again, where the name becomes so paramount, we have two kinds of resistance that occurs in the setting of mycobacterium obsessus. Mutational resistance, we know exactly where uh, that region is in that gene that must be uh, uh, mutated to develop it. Uh, resistance, we can detect it three or four different ways. We can just do a regular three to five day incubation. That's what you usually get from your laboratories, saying it's resistant or not. Uh, we can do sequencing and look for uh, the gene. Uh, we can do a line probe assay also looking for that mutation. The other form, which is really important in this uh, disease, is inducible resistance. Uh, these have an uh, ERM genes called ERM41, and uh, this modifies the binding site for the macrolides. So in the presence of a macrolide, what we see is the development of resistance. It occurs, usually we start to see it at three days, by seven days, by 14, it's complete. So it's a very rapid induction of this system, we, so the way we detect it is we just incubate the culture longer, give time for that macrolide to induce it. Uh, three days is just not enough time. And then you'll see by 14 days whether there's this inducible resistance. We can look at the length of the gene, but this will miss 10 to 15% of the cases. The best way is to sequence, uh, or the more rapid way I should say is to sequence, and there's even a line probe, commercial assay, that can detect uh, these mutations. So we have two forms of resistance, but it's the inducible in which that subspecies name is so important. And this is how it plays out. Let's say you have clarithromycin susceptibility results at that first juncture, the, the short incubation. It's susceptible. And then you hold it for 14 days, it's still susceptible. 
What that means is that this, this is a non-functional gene. It's not working. Um, so that means it's probably mycelians. Most of the time, it will be mycelians. It will be macrolide susceptible, so you should definitely use a macrolide because you're going to see it makes a big difference. Another scenario is the first one, three to five days susceptible, but as you hold it to 14, it's now resistant. Therefore, it has inducible resistance. That means it's usually obsessive, uh, except in 10 to 15% of um, the, the strains or Baletii. And that means you could use it. We don't really know if it works or not in this study. The one that's very clear is if there's mutational resistance, because that shows up at, at both time points. Um, and it, there, you would only use it for its immunomodulatory or anti-inflammatory. So understanding this inducible resistance is paramount to being able to treat the patients best. Here's the approach. Your lab tells you whether there's functional or ERM resistance. If they can't tell you that, they should at least tell you which species it is. Because if it's a, um, a functional ERM gene, which means it induces that resistance, it's usually going to be one of these strains. Uh, otherwise, it's mycelians. But we would prefer to actually know the functionality of the ERM gene. If it's a functional ERM gene, then we don't think the macrolide is adding very much. We're going to look for two or more other drugs. We usually uh, include amikacin. We give these for two to 10 years, depending on uh, what, what our goals are. And then we go into a continuation phase. Others just give this periodically, much as we do for pseudomonas exacerbations in our CF patients. You hope it's mycelians and therefore a non-functional gene. There we can use the macrolide. We don't have to look for too many additional drugs, which we don't have, because this is pretty much what we're working with. So we're usually trying to find two intravenous drugs. So amicacin may be one, one or two of these, and then some oral drugs, none of which are indicated in this disease process. And then we try to treat for 12 months of culture negativity, but that is very difficult to achieve. Here is the bottom line. Four studies, one which we were involved in, in uh, uh, with Dr. Ko. So you can see the population that was studied here were mostly non-cystic fibrosis cases. And in each of these studies, they were able to subspeciate between abscessus and mycelians. If you look at sputum conversion, if the patient had mycelians, which means that they had a, that gene doesn't work, which means that the macrolide does work, 88% is better than MAC culture conversion. But if they have abscesses, only 25% culture. And look how consistent this is across these studies. That if the patient has mycelians, this is a curable infection. But if your lab only tells you a subsessus, you can't possibly know that. Critical to make that name distinction. And the final issue is then that, you know, there are a lot of reinfection and recurrences in these patients like we see in MAC. This is a study we published last year. These were patients who had obsessives, not mycelians, but true obsessives, cumulative recurrence rate. So if, once you stop therapy and you follow them, you can see that they're getting reinfected at a very high rate, but often it's with a different species. If you look to see if they got the same, uh, if they got obsessives, that kind of capped out at about 20%. But when we genotyped them with RET-PCR, all of them were a different strain than they started with. So recurrence is common in this field. It's something we just have to deal with. So let me stop by saying that I think I've made it clear, I hope this is important disease. Uh, the numbers greatly outnumber TB uh, in North America, and the prevalence is increasing at fairly dramatic levels. Um, diagnosis, you have to look at the clinical situation, your symptoms in your patient, the radiographic uh, disease, and whether there's um, progression. But I want to add to the importance, you need to know the name of the species. Which one do they have? When you decide to treat, you have to integrate that patient data with the organism and the goals of therapy. Reinfection is occurring. If you don't have data to sh be able to show you that your patient who started with avium now has young and dense or intracellular, uh, how, do you, how do we understand how to manage these patients? I, I don't know how to do it without that information. And then I believe that sources of infection are different among the different species. The possibility of transmission, particularly among our CF patients, looks like that may vary by species pathogenesis and even treatment outcomes are associated with not only species when it comes to MAC, but even subspecies. And who knows that we may find a strain within a subspecies that may be more virulent than other strains. So I want, I want to just give a plug to a lot of the people who I work with and have contributed some of the data that I uh, presented, particularly uh, Jerry Nick and his group.
Uh, Michael Strong and his group have done all the sequencing data that we do uh, with this and other studies that I didn't present. Um, I, a, a big uh, hello to Wonjin Ko. If you search his name, he's from Samsung. He has more publications in NTM in the last 10 years than probably anyone on earth. Uh, he was an amazing guy in some of our funding. And for the fellows, I just want to, and others who are interested in these diseases, these are some of the things that we do. I put this in because Dave was interested in education. So I wanted to let you know we are trying to achieve what he wanted us to do, and that's medical education. We have an NTM provider course. It's usually in the fall every year. It'll be September, October next year. Uh, we have an NTM um, lecture series for patients and families. So we have our patients and families come. It's the day after this course. Uh, we still are doing, uh, we are now at our 56 annual Denver TB course, 56 years without a break. Uh, and the next one is scheduled for April. And for those who are looking for training, we have a monthly rotation for pulmonary and ID fellows. We actually pay you to come. Uh, we give you a stipend to defray some of the costs. It's not everything, but $2,300 is not bad. And you come spend a week, I'm sorry, a month with us on our mycobacterial ward. So every month we have a fellow from somewhere in the U.S. who comes spends a month with us. And I have a Loire Fellowship that's going to be reopening soon. This is an endowed fellowship to spend one to two years focusing on mycobacteria at National Jewish. Uh, and that will be opening, I believe, in March because my current fellow is going back to Australia. I will end with why we're here. This is one of my favorite pictures. I was scanning, well, here's a good picture of Dave. And this is everything I remember, a sparkle. You can see the sparkle in his eye. You can see the smile that never left. And he always looked at me, and I always thought he knew something I didn't know. <laughs> <laughs> what, what, but, but then he didn't ever tell me, so I don't, I don't know what it is. <laughs> but let's remember why we're here to honor uh, Dave. And I really appreciate all of you coming to be part of this. Thank you.